Ask Nerlag, Nerlag Anna, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Nice job. <laughs> it makes you hoarse, though. That was good. Actually, the, the guy, uh, Gerard Doyle, who reads the audiobook version, he, uh, he does a great job. But boy, those dwarvish sections in the ancient language, he, he ends up having to work over those a couple of times. I was home, or I am homeschooled right now <laughs> in high school, and you were, or you, yeah, you were as well. Um, did that have any influence at all on the books? I mean, did it help being homeschooled over going to school? Or, I mean, I don't know. What are your thoughts on homeschooling? Oh, it had a huge influence. Um, you know, it's certainly possible I might have gotten a good education if I'd gone to a public school. Uh, there, I know there are a lot of great teachers in public schools, and I'm, I'm not knocking that at all. But if I hadn't been homeschooled, I never would have had the opportunity to write Aragon, uh, simply because being homeschooled allowed me to graduate early. We never took summers off. So, you know, you work through the year, and, and we, we took time off, but if you're... So, you know, you work through the year, and, and we, we took time off, but if you're able to work through the year, that adds up to some significant extra extra time uh, over the years. So graduating early gave me the time to write, and without that time to write, I never could have finished Aragon. I just, I couldn't have been in school and writing at the same time. Some people are able to do it, but I think I would have just been too, too busy to finish a book. Uh, and of course, homeschooling allowed me to pursue my own interests. You know, I never got no one ever made fun of me for being interested in what I was interested in. So I never felt ashamed about what I was doing or that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. I just did it and I had fun and it, uh, you know, as a result we're sitting here today with these books. So, no, I'm very grateful to my parents that they homeschooled me and, uh, and also my sister. Have you ever felt discriminated against because of that? Before? Never. Never. Um, I mean, I suppose it could happen in some areas, but I've never had that experience. I mean, part of it is I just wasn't around a lot of kids my own, my own age, so there really wasn't a lot of opportunity for discrimination, if you will. Actually, most kids I met my own age, when I was being homeschooled, if I told them I was being homeschooled, their reaction was uh, one of interest. I mean, they, wanted, they, they were curious, they had questions, and most of them were saying, oh man, I wish I didn't have to go to school, you know, mm -hmm. public school. Uh, I think the, thing, the only thing I got tired of was people asking me, uh, but, but, but aren't you going to have trouble socializing? That is that's worst. my question, yeah. I yeah. Ask me that. I hate that. Yeah, I mean, after a while, that's, you can kind of get tired of being asked for that. <laughs> well, I have a question about Galbatorix. I've searched for this answer high and low on the internet, and maybe I'm just not being thorough, but um, after, I, I believe, his dragon was killed, he asked for another one, and he was denied. Why was he denied? Um, if I'm remembering what I said in... Aragon correctly, and I think this was also said from Oramus in, in Eldest, it was because the writers saw that he'd already become mad, Im insane, imba unbalanced by the loss of his dragon, and they just didn't trust him. And plus, you know, he was asking for another dragon egg, but there was a good chance that even if they presented him to a dragon egg or more than one, it wouldn't have hatched for him. So really his asking was more, really just didn't make sense in the first place and they recognized that. With the, with the being like presented to an egg, I always wondered about that if, I mean, I was wondering how long are people put in front of an egg because with Aragon, it took Saphira how long to hatch for him? Yeah, how but... How long do other, does it usually take, like, I mean, how long are these people like in front of these eggs for? That's, a, that's something actually I thought about quite a bit. Um, Saphira was slightly a different case. I mean, you have to remember, she was imprisoned by Galbatorix before, you know, almost a hundred years. Well, about 80 years, actually. And, you know, who knows what he may have been trying to do mentally to her and magically to try to get her to hatch for someone. Uh, and then, of course, the egg got rescued and was being taken around by Arya. And Saphira would have been able to, even though she hadn't hatched, she would have been able to sense Arya's presence to a certain degree, especially since Arya took the egg around for pretty much the whole... Um, 20, well, actually 16-some years that she was ferrying the egg around. So when Arya was attacked and Saphira's egg, Arya sent the egg to Aragon, Saphira, she might have decided right away that Aragon was the one she was going to hatch for, but she also might have been very uncertain about whether it was safe to do so. So I think the delay was part of that. She was waiting to see if there was, you know, Galbatorx was going to jump out of, you know, out behind a house and say, ha, ha tricked you. <laughs> um, uh, I think the way the writers would have done it is they would have had, a, you know, a dragon egg, and they would have brought potential prospective writers before the egg, and they would have had someone next to the egg 
in you know sensing the thoughts of the, the the dragon inside the egg, and they would have been able to tell whether or not the dragon had made that choice. Um, do we know? I don't know. Maybe I missed it. Do we know what the name Aragon means yet, or is that for later on in the series? Not. We don't know from these two books, but as far as anything further than that, I won't say a okay. word. Well, I figured. I just, you know. Isn't, yeah, Aragon was the name of the first writer, and wouldn't that name, like, if it, like, wouldn't it have some spell or The some word magic? itself? You mean yeah. the name itself? Because it's a very historic. No comment. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, names are power. Yeah, I mean, that's a uh, belief often held in this world, uh, not to mention Aragon's, and Aragon bears a very powerful name, so I'm sure uh, it's, it's not a powerless name, but anything more than that I'm not going to say. Do Brahms' seven words have anything to do with the seven promises? No comment. Ooh. <laughs> well, when I was reading, when I went Good back... Good question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of it here. Yeah. When I went back and actually like reread the books, I noticed that you used not just foreshadowing, but almost like really obvious foreshadowing. And I was almost like, how could I not, you know, know this was going to happen? Do you do that on purpose, or is it? I do actually. Um, I think a lot of uh, when I started Aragon, when Aragon first came out, a lot of people didn't. I mean, didn't really know where the story was going, and I was able to put a lot of things in Aragon. In fact, things I had to fight with with my editor because she said this doesn't need to be in here, this seems extraneous, why can't we take this out? And I said, ah, but you don't know what happens in two or three or four. Well, actually it was two or three at that point. Yeah, um, yeah I basically, I want the story to be very, very clear and simple when you know everything and you look back over on what's already happened and you read through and you say, of course, that fits together, it's, it, it, everything makes sense. Um, so my goal is that when you first read it, you don't necessarily understand everything. When you've read the next book or the last books, then you read back through and you understand a lot more. And hopefully that'll, you know, make a reread uh, a much more enjoyable experience. Brissinger, for example, is going to answer some questions, I think, and, and have some revelations that will cast the events in Eldest, for example, in a new light as well. Should we discuss some Brissinger theories? Uh, you're welcome to. I probably won't say a word, though. I'll give us a chance to talk. Yeah, let's talk. I had a theory. I think the Vault of Souls is Galbatorix's source of power, and I think that one of the reasons why his power keeps growing is that whenever he or the Razak kill someone, they take their soul and put it in the Vault of Souls, and then they use that soul to, and the person's energy to fuel their own power. So that's why Murtag's consciousness felt like hundreds of different people. One of the things that I've really been pleased about is that Aragon, I was able to start with a very, I mean, the setup that I, I enjoyed reading about and that I wanted to write about. Young man, dragon, magic sword, wise old mentor, horrible evil villain, beautiful elvish princess, what can I do with this? And as I've said earlier, one of the things I've really enjoyed with this series is that with each of these books since Aragon, I've been able to sort of expand the story in my own directions and, and sort of move in new areas. So. What I'm saying in as, as essence, as a long answer to your question, is that there are a lot of elements in the third book and the fourth book that no one's managed to guess yet. And other than that, I'm not saying a word. It, and that makes me very happy, too, because <laughs> if everyone had been able to guess everything in the next two yeah. books, I mean, why bother writing them? I think that means that that's a wrong theory. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it always seems like that. Um, authors, like with Harry Potter, I mean, I had a lot of theories, because I read all Harry Potter books, had a lot of theories, and more than half of them were all wrong. Yeah, it was a very clever last book. Yeah, very clever. Was, yeah. Very clever ending. Is Aragorn considered a full elf? Is he all the way elf or is he still part human? You know, that's something uh, because of course in, in the end of the second book he goes underneath, undergoes a sort of a transformation under the Agate Blodrin, the blood oath celebration of the elves. And uh, it's something he actually discusses with Arya a little bit more in Brissinger, so I don't want to get too much into it, but no, I mean, he's not 